Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing well today. Uh, my name is Ryan Davis. I'll be presenting on coronary artery disease. My email is listed below. If you have any questions after the presentation, please feel free to email me. I'll get back with you as soon as I can. All right, let's get started. So the scope of today, what we're going to be looking at is the nuts and bolts of coronary artery disease, uh, what the causes are, the pathophysiology, the symptomology, the treatment. Uh, then once we do that, we'll look into a case study of someone with coronary artery disease, plans and recommendations after completing our cardiac rehab program, and then the future application. So coronary artery disease is abbreviated as CAD. Potential causes of CAD could be poor diet, the, the higher fat diet, so saturated fats, the meats, the, the, the trans fats, anything that brings cholesterol into the body is, is going to lead to atherosclerosis, and we'll get into that in a second. Uh, lack of exercise and genetics, which genetics we'll also get into as we look at this case study. So atherosclerosis is, is the cause of coronary artery disease. You have the walls of the arteries, and when the walls of the arteries get damaged, cholesterol deposits into those walls, and then plaque starts to build up. So then it starts to occlude the lumen, uh, the hole at which blood is flowing through the blood vessel. So the more occlusion you have, the harder it is for blood to flow, and the harder it is for oxygen to get to the working tissues of the heart. So we're looking at lack of blood flow to the myocardium, right? So coronary artery disease. So the arteries that supply oxygen-rich blood to the working tissues of the heart. When you have less oxygen, you have ischemia. And when you have ischemia, it could lead to a myocardial infarction, which is where cells are dying. The cells are dying, they're, they want oxygen, they're working, but they're not getting it. And that's leading to the myocardial infarction. And because of that, it can lead to angina. But angina doesn't mean you're having a myocardial infarction. Angina could mean you're just having ischemia, just slight ischemia of the heart. It could lead to heart failure where the blood's not pumping out of the left ventricle like it should. Only let's say 10% of the blood may be pumping out and it's not delivering oxygen to the rest of the body. Uh, coronary artery disease, disease can also cause sudden death. You could have a blockage and we'll look at a figure later of the heart. You could have a blockage in the widow maker which is the main artery that supplies the heart right there. And if you have a blockage there, blood flow stops, doesn't get oxygen to the rest of the heart, heart doesn't work, and you could have sudden death. So some symptomology. So angina. So as I said earlier, I had, had some angina um, in heart disease and coronary artery disease because of ischemia. You have stable and unstable. So stable is what we like to work with in exercise because when someone exercises, let's say for 10 minutes, 10 minutes on the bike, and they feel angina and they feel chest pain. They're exercising and they stop and the chest pain stops. That's fine, that's stable angina. Unstable angina is where they get on the bike to exercise, they have a little angina, 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 and they get off the bike and they eat lunch and they still have angina and they have dinner and they still have angina and then they go to work the next day and they have angina again. It's, it's unpredictable. It, it, doesn't have a pattern that you can follow or track. And with angina, a lot of times comes anxiety. People get angina and that strangling feeling in their chest and everything starts to close in around them. And because you're not getting as much oxygen, your heart's not working optimally, you can experience fatigue, GI pain, shortness of breath, excessive sweating, nausea, and dizziness. So what are some treatments for coronary artery disease? Well, it, it depends on how early you catch it or how late you catch it. So let's say you have a myocardial, myocardial infarction, or, or as we'll look in the case study later, if they're in a heart cath and they realize they need to do open heart surgery, what they'll do is do a coronary artery bypass graft. And what this is, if you have a blockage, and let's say your left anterior descending, what they'll do is they'll take a vein, the saphenous vein from your leg, and they'll attach it above that, above that blockage and attach it below the blockage. So that way blood flows into the vein and then below the blockage and then supplies the rest of the heart with blood. But that involves cracking your chest open, harvesting a saphenous vein, and then attaching it back to the heart. Very invasive. Heart cath, however, is usually inserted through the groin through the femoral artery up the abdominal aorta into the aortic arch and into the heart. 
So let's say that same left anterior descending is blocked. What we'll do is, let's say it's 75, 80% blocked. We'll stick a guide wire down there. They'll stick a stent, which is closed, down into that blockage, and then they'll open it up with a balloon. And what that does is that opens up that blood vessel. So it goes from being really closed off to opened up again, and blood's allowed to flow in there. And like I so said, that can be done just a small incision in the groin right here, through the femoral artery, and up the body to the heart. It can also be done through the wrists, and patients are awake for most of these surgeries. Diet, there's literature coming out now that's suggesting that diet can actually improve and reverse coronary artery disease and take away some of the cholesterol deposits and the fatty streaks in the arteries. Drugs, so statins. Statins have been an effective and useful drug in controlling cholesterol and hyperlipidemia oh, for, for years now. And beta blockers, those are more uh, symptoms, so reduces workload on the heart, as well as nitroglycerin, reduces workload, it's, it's a vasodilator, so it, it's helped to prevent angina. All right, so now let's get into the case study. So this is someone that I got to work with uh, in 2018, last summer. He's a 58-year-old male, came to the hospital in 2018, just chest pain at 140 beats per minute. Uh, however, some history on him. In 2007, he was having a heart catheterization. And in his heart catheterization, he had an end stemmy a non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Severe coronary artery disease, what they found. Left anterior descending, right coronary artery, ended up having a five-way bypass. So remember when I was talking about they attached the saphenous stain above the blockage and then below the blockage to allow blood flow? They did that five times, which is just, just extreme, extreme. High presence of coronary artery disease, so we're going to fast forward back to 2018. Hyperlipidemia, bradycardia, but he is a cyclist and he was exercising regularly, so that's fairly normal. Depression, and then familial hypercholesterolemia. So this is a defect on the 19th chromosome. And in short, this recycles LDL. So once you put LDL into your body, it, it doesn't come out. It just recycles over and over and over. So you can imagine how bad that would be if you just kept taking in cholesterol and LDL over and over. You build up so much of it. So that's why he was on statins and he was trying to change his diet to improve his cholesterol levels because of the genetics. He was just built, he was just dealt a bad hand. So in 2018, comes in the hospital with angina again. He says, oh, my chest is hurting. Severe coronary artery disease to the circumflex again, but this time they can stent it. So they stent to the distal circumflex. He also shows left, left basal and mid inferior severe hypokinesis, um, not contracting as hard. They do a CPET. His anaerobic threshold values are here. Uh, max values are listed as below. Everything's fairly normal for a cardiac patient, nothing out of the ordinary, but this is what we use for our exercise prescription. So right here, uh, here's a diagram of the heart. So you have the left main artery right here. Right here, if you have a blockage right here, this is known as the widow maker because you're not supplying blood to all this area of the heart right here. So that's what I was referring to earlier. And right here, you have your right coronary artery, your left anterior descending, and your circumflex coming around. So this case study patient had blockages everywhere. He had them here, he had them here, and he had them here. Everywhere. So he had a five-way bypass between these two, and then had a stent put somewhere down here in the circumflex. And here were his lab values. I mean, pretty good lab values. Pretty good lab values. Um, however, there is some literature coming out stating that Three out of four people, so 75% of the people that have a heart attack, three of them have LDL below normal standards. So even though it looks normal here, and the doctor would say it's okay, it needs to be lower for him because of his familiar hypercholesterolemia and his history of coronary artery disease. He needs to get these as low as possible. 
So even though he's got LDL of 83, HDL of 44, triglycerides of 72, they need to be even lower. So what medicines is he on? He's on aspirin, he's on clopidogrel, it's an antiplatelet, mainly for the stent that was put in, the distal circumflex. When you have a stent put in and the body, you know, attaches blood cells to it, we don't want that happening, so the antiplatelet allows them to pass through easily, easier. He's taking a supplement, coenzyme Q10. Uh, he's taking nitrostat as needed when his angina started to rise and presented. And then rubostatin, so he's on the antilipidemic, like I mentioned earlier, and is also trying to improve his diet and exercise on top of everything. So when he came to intensive cardiac rehab, he was doing 30 minutes to an hour, five days a week of the beach body program. He had no orthopedic considerations, and his goals were to improve stamina and increase strength and knowledge of strength training. So he loved to bike, he loved to trail run. He wanted to get back to feeling safe doing that again. So achieve 180 minutes of exercise per week was our goal for him. So he only came and saw us two days a week. So we asked the rest of his exercise was on his own. We wanted him to feel comfortable being on the bike again. So if he came to cardiac rehab and did great, but didn't feel comfortable on the bike, then it doesn't translate well. So here's his exercise prescription. He had a frequency of two days per week with Ornish. He had, it was a HIIT training protocol, so a low intensity of 20 to uh, 120 to 129 beats per minute, and the high was 137 and 147. So what this was, this was a HIIT training protocol that was four minutes on, four minutes off. So we did four minutes at the low intensity, four minutes at the high intensity. This is incredible for a patient with severe coronary artery disease, had a five-way bypass, 11 years later, comes back, puts a stent in. This is incredible for them to be doing HIIT training. He did 30 minutes per session. He started out on the upright bike and then moved to the treadmill. Volume, the goal was 180 minutes per week. When he was with us, he was doing the 30 minutes. He was doing 60 minutes a week. And he progressed from the upper body, or the upright bike, excuse me, to the treadmill, and increased resistance from 14 to 15 while staying within heart rate range. So 14 to 15 is just the level or the workload of the bike. So to increase that while maintaining the same heart rate is phenomenal. It's what we want. The body is adapting and building those collateral vessels. So by doing this, he can do more. He can exercise at a greater capacity without developing angina. So his progression, he came in 180 pounds, blood pressure 118 over 66. So as you see here, his weight drops, his blood pressure drops, his METs increase. The six minute walk we didn't do uh, post, but his heart rate comes up a little bit, but that's fine, still bradycardic. Just awesome. So he's doing, doing really, really, really well. So progression continued. His initial goal is he wanted to increase strength and knowledge of strength training, increase his stamina. Progression, what actually happened? Muscular strength and endurance have increased. He got stronger with weight, sets, reps, everything. Stamina increased greatly. He felt better with activities of daily living as well as exercise. So he got back on the bike. He feels good on the bike. Not as much chest pain. His legs feel good. He's breathing right again. He feels very comfortable. And his knowledge of exercise has greatly increased. So after the eight weeks, he came to us, and he didn't even have to ask us what to do. He knew exactly what to do, where to go, what to do. It was incredible. All we had to do was monitor his EKG and heart rate, and everything else was on him. So we feel very comfortable with him going to another gym, finding uh, an, a bike or a program that he can do. So what's next? So for him, he was going to join the Employee Health Center. So as I mentioned, he's going to join a health center. We're going to help him. Uh, figure out how to design some workouts and help him through some workouts that he can do on his own. Continue the HIIT training and then start road and trail cycling more. So he had some kids uh, as well, kids and grandkids. So he wanted to get on the road, trail cycling with them some more, to kind of stay involved and stay active, keep up with them. So future application. So staying up to date on the literature is huge. We need to stay up to date on the literature because this is cutting edge stuff. This HIIT training, this intensive cardiac rehab, this is all brand new stuff that's just coming out. 
and it's awesome. It's benefiting the patient so much. I've, just, just from an uh, anecdotal view, I've, I've worked both in a regular cardiac rehab setting and an intensive cardiac rehab setting. Cardiac rehab does not benefit the patients as much as intensive does, and this stuff is the real deal. So staying up to date on the literature and knowing what the next latest and greatest thing is going to be is awesome, so you can be ahead of the curve on those things. And maximizing patient time in cardiac rehab. So he only got 30 minutes of exercise every session, he saw us twice a week. So we need to figure out how to teach him everything, how to make him exercise, and how to get the most out of that 30 minutes. We need to be organized, we need to be effective in what we did, efficient, and then be intentional with what we were doing. So just being very organized and intentional with our planning. And then discover the purpose of each individual. So getting to know him, figuring out why they're doing it. So he was doing it for his grandkids and his kids and wanted to keep up cycling and running and doing whatever he could to keep up with them. So that drove him every day and made him want to be there and want to work. Because at the end of the day, we can do everything in the world, write all the exercise prescriptions and the latest and greatest news on diet, but if they don't implement it, it's got, you know, it's, it's a car with no tires. It's going nowhere. So find the purpose, find the drive behind people. Even if people think they don't have a drive, find something that drives them and motivates them and gets them to where they want to be. So with that, uh, I conclude my presentation. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you.